everyone in High New Mexico. I'm Carrie Stewart. I'm one of the urologists at Christa St. Vincent in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I was hoping to talk to you today about regaining control of your bladder and bowel. I have a lot of patients that come in to me and talk about their bladder and bowel symptoms that are disrupting their life. And sometimes I hear patients mention that they missed the best part of the movie because they had to run to the toilet. Or when they're out and about getting groceries, they have to know where every bathroom is during their errands so they don't have an accident. Or patients might say, I have to cut back on what I drink before I go on a trip. Those are really common symptoms that I'm faced with in the office all the time, and you're not alone. There are a lot of different patients who complain about these symptoms. It's more common than you think, even though we don't talk about it a lot with our friends or family. Your condition can really affect your quality of life. I've noticed that some patients have limited their participation in certain physical activities. A lot of patients like to do step aerobics or weightlifting, soccer, or you know, go on a walk, go to the community center. And sometimes having leakage of bowel or bladder or too much urinary urgency or frequency really reduces these social interactions. Patients can get depressed if they're socially isolated. It can make people want to avoid intimacy if they're leaking during intercourse. And sometimes patients have decreased uh, productivity at work, like racing to the toilet from their desk chair all the time, needing to skip work because you're too afraid of the social implications of the leakage. And at home, patients have to wear pads, diapers, depends, possibly put on special bedding like plastic covers on their mattresses. And this can be costly, not to mention embarrassing. Overactive bladder is a really common condition and it affects an estimated 50 million people in the United States. An additional 20 million people suffer from fecal incontinence, that's where you leak stool or bowel movement, and a lot of people have a combination of those things. A lot of people will wait until they have severe symptoms to seek treatment, and only half of those people with severe symptoms are looking for care. So definitely, if you're noticing you're having some of these symptoms, feel free to come in and discuss it with your doctor. There are a bunch of conditions we're gonna talk about today, like overactive bladder, urinary retention, and fecal incontinence. So overactive bladder is that type of problem where you're rushing to the toilet, you're going too often or too frequently, you're waking up in the night to go to the bathroom. Urinary retention is a condition that can make it really hard to go to the bathroom, and it's more common in men than women. You may be standing in front of the toilet, waiting for a while before the pee comes out. Maybe you go to the bathroom a ton of times, and just tiny amounts come out, or you're pushing or straining to go pee. Fecal incontinence is an involuntary loss of stool or gas, and a lot of people find this incredibly embarrassing. Normally, when your bladder functions, your kidneys are filtering your blood and they're making the waste product called urine. That is passed into the bladder and it fills throughout the day. The rate of filling of your bladder depends on how much fluid you take in, so you don't necessarily have to drink eight glasses of water unless your doctor told you to. That's an old wives' tale. Then once your bladder is full, nerve signals are sent between your bladder and brain until your bladder is time to urinate. Your bladder will squeeze, the valve will open, and urine will release. So what's overactive bladder? That just means you're having urinary frequency, you're going to the bathroom eight or more times a day, so maybe every 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, every hour, you feel like you're going to the bathroom all the time. Urinary urgency, that's that sense that you're having to rush to get there. Overactive bladder can be just characterized by some of these symptoms or all of them. Urgency incontinence is involuntary loss of urine. So you may leak into your underwear, wet your pants, wet a pad or a diaper. And nocturia, that means your bladder is waking you up in the night to go to the bathroom. And you have to get up to go to the bathroom in order to go back to sleep. The types of urinary incontinence are many, and a lot of them have overlapping symptoms. So stress incontinence is different than what we have been talking about, and it's not the stress of your daily life or stress from work, it's the stress of abdominal pressure. If you cough, laugh, sneeze, jump on a trampoline, lift really heavy weights, maybe you might have pee escape from your bladder without intending to. Mixed incontinence is urinary leakage with that urge to rush to the toilet, or if you cough, laugh, sneeze, and you have some of both of that. Let's talk about normal bowel function now. As the rectum fills, the stretch receptors in the wall of your colon will become activated. Then nerve signals are sent between your bowel and your brain that make you feel like you need to go. You go to the toilet, you relax your pelvic muscles, and you're allowed to release the stool then. Fecal incontinence is some dysfunction along that pathway, and you might leak stool, you might leak some liquid or some mucus. You might find that you're rushing to the toilet to have a bowel movement, so you might have fecal urgency. Fecal just means bowel. 
or a stool. You might notice that you have past stool in your underwear or a pad without even knowing it. That's passive fecal incontinence or soiling. And so if you're having those symptoms, it's treatable. So it's not a normal part of getting older. It's not just part of being a woman or a man. I wouldn't say that these are specifically just because you have issues with your prostate or caused by something you did wrong. I don't want you to think that this is just something you have to live with because we do have a number of treatment options. I'm gonna to talk to you about the patient care pathway or the treatment options for overactive bladder, for urinary retention, and for fecal incontinence. So initially, let's talk about overactive bladder again. So some of the things you may wanna do is bladder training exercises. This is like Kegel exercises or squeezing the pelvic floor muscles. Or say the FedEx man shows up on your door and you're in the bathroom and you need to cut off the flow of urine and you don't wanna miss him for the third time because they're gonna send your package back. You're gonna squeeze those muscles real hard. Those are your Kegel muscles. And a lot of people think they know how to squeeze a Kegel muscle, but not always doing it quite right. So I'd recommend you go to pelvic floor physical therapist for this or talk with your doctor about that. You can do lifestyle changes. Again, you don't have to drink two liters of water to be healthy. That might be something Dr. Oz propagated. So just drink enough water to curb your thirst. And if your doctor has told you to drink a certain amount of water for health reasons, of course, listen to that. There are some really great medications out there to treat overactive bladder as well. They take about four weeks to begin working and a lot of them have a pretty low side effect profile. So I love trying some medications for this to make people's quality of life better. Advanced therapies beyond the lifestyle changes, beyond your Kegel exercises and past medications include something called percutaneous tibial nerve stem. This is a pretty cool and very low risk option. We basically place a acupuncture needle near a nerve behind your ankle and stimulate that with a little generator. It's not really painful at all. And it takes about 30 minutes to do once a week in the office. And it has about a 50% rate of improvement of your symptoms. So there's no risk or health risk to this. And you can come into the office and hopefully we can make your symptoms a little better for you. Another advanced therapy is Botox. And we use Botox today for a ton of stuff, for contractures, for paraplegics, for preventing wrinkles in our foreheads. And your bladder is just a big muscle with a waterproof lining. So we can inject Botox with a camera, with a little needle in the office into the muscle of the bladder and partially paralyze it. That stops your bladder from squeezing too often or too frequently. It can reduce the amount of leakage that you have, the amount of frequency you have, and the number of times you wake up in the night to go to the bathroom. The procedure is minimally uncomfortable, done in the office, and lasts six to nine months. So I really am a big fan of Botox for these complaints as well. One more option I really like is a sacral nerve modulation system by Axonix. This is a device that's like a bladder stimulator or like a bladder pacemaker. It's a minor procedure in the operating room done under some sedation to make you comfortable. And you may have a few little needle pokes uh, along your sacrum um, or a small incision on the buttocks below your belt line but above where you sit. This device is really cool because it lasts about 15 years. So that's a benefit of it over Botox. However, it does require a trip to the operating room. So a little bit more about Exonix sacral nerve modulation therapy. This can be used for treatment of overactive bladder, like the urgency frequency leakage. And it can also be used for urinary retention, which is really cool because there aren't a lot of good treatments for urinary retention. A lot of people are catheter dependent or have to self catheterize. Urinary retention can actually respond to the sacral nerve stimulator, which is one of the few options or surgical management options for retention or, or inability to pass your urine. Fecal incontinence is also treatable by the sacral nerve modulation system. 80% of people get some amount of benefit from the fecal incontinence treatment with sacral nerve stimulation, and about 40% of those people are dry. So if you've already tried diet modifications, fiber, and worked with your primary care doctor or your gastroenterologist, and you're still having out of control bowel movements, we can try the sacral nerve stimulator for you. And how does this work? Great question. It's gonna suppress the abnormal signals between your bladder and your brain where your bladder says, hey, I gotta go, I gotta go. And your brain's like, hey man, no, you don't have to go to the bathroom right now. You can wait a little bit longer. You're not gonna leak, you can calm down. It tells your bladder to try to function a little bit more normally. Axionix offers two different size implants for the generator, which are actually both pretty small. They're really thin, and so I know it shows on the screen that it's about the size of a quarter, but just for reference, this is the rechargeable device. So it's pretty small, so if you're a really thin person, you might wanna choose something like this, and it's gonna go in the fatty part of the glutes. 
And then the non-rechargeable device, both of these devices last about 15 years, is a little bit bigger, but still not very big. You wouldn't be able to see this through your pants or your underwear, but you would be able to feel it if you're really looking for it. Many patients who have a sacral nerve stimulator or a device like this also need MRIs, and both of them are MRI safe. 93% of patients have meaningful and lasting improvement with their device, and we know that it'll last around 15 years. Lots of people are very happy with their device. So I do have a lot of patients, just like this testimonial person, that are very happy with their device, and they come in, they're like, hey, I wish I hadn't waited so long to approach my doctor about having something like this done, because I've been wearing pads or depends for years. So people can really get back to having a normal life and normal social interactions once they have a device implanted, if they've, especially if they've already failed other you know, interventions like physical therapy or medications. Next, we're going to talk about stress urinary incontinence. So stress incontinence is not the stress, again, of your daily life, or maybe their kids are screaming, or that you had a tough day at work. It's about sneezing, exercising, laughing, coughing, or walking. It's more common in women than men, but men have it too, sometimes after prostate surgery. So there are a lot of different things we can do. Stress incontinence is very common. It affects one in three women at some point in their lives. And you don't actually have to have had kids for this to occur to you. It happens to all women. It does happen to men, but again, it's usually related to prostate surgery. So again, you can develop some problems with your quality of life if you have stress incontinence, like depression, social isolation. If you're really wet, wearing a wet pad around can make the, the skin really uncomfortable. You might change the way you interact with your family. Maybe you don't want to travel to your daughter's for Thanksgiving because you don't want her to be bothered by the number of times you have to stop on the way to go, go to the bathroom. Or maybe you're spending a ton of money on, on pads or depends or diapers or you're having to change your clothes a lot at work or you know, anything like that it can really affect you. And, and so don't wait to come see a doc. There are some treatments that can help us with stress incontinence. If you're a man, if you're a woman, it doesn't matter. Pelvic floor exercises, again, we talked about those a little bit for overactive bladder or urgency incontinence. Again, those are a great option for stress incontinence as well. They'll teach you how to control those pelvic floor muscles, to squeeze that valve, to give you that extra moment to make it to the toilet. Urethral bulking is one of my favorite options for surgical management for women, and surgical slings are a great option for men and women. Here's a little bit about pelvic floor exercises. I definitely recommend doing this with a physical therapist because they have a extra training in how to teach people how to do these exercises correctly. Let's start with a sling. A mid-urethral sling, just like urethral bulking, has been around for decades. And the goal of the sling is to support the urethra. It's kind of like a little hammock. It has about 90% success rate, and it usually lasts about 10 years, but you can have it redone. This is for men and for women, although the devices are a little bit different. It works for both populations. I really love doing slings. They're a pretty minor uh, surgical procedure, although there are some post-op restrictions and recovery. I think it's wonderful. It's polypropylene mesh, and a lot of people have heard about mesh litigation. This is not that same kind of mesh. The mesh that was used in the past was for a different condition called prolapse, and that mesh is no longer commercially available for use. Mid-urethral slings are still done widely across the country and are FDA approved. Another option for stress urinary incontinence is urethral bulking. One of the benefits of bulking over a sling is there's a little bit less recovery time. This is a slightly less invasive procedure because there are no incisions. So we use a small camera and we inject a filler agent. This filler agent was previously developed for cosmetic procedures, but now we can use it to bulk the urethra or basically narrow the valve to increase resistance to leakage. It's pretty great. So what is Bulkamin? Like we talked about, it's a hydrogel, it's like a filler agent, and we use it to compress the urethra. And we basically inject it in four locations within the valve or the urethra to increase resistance to leakage when you cough, laugh, sneeze, jumping jacks, or jump on a trampoline, lift up your kid, lift heavy weights, lift your laundry basket. It's 92% successful. It's simple. It has long-lasting relief, around five to seven years. So I really love all these different options for incontinence, and I really love helping people become dry. I know urinary incontinence and fecal incontinence can be a big burden in our lives, so if you want to get some symptom relief or you're interested in having a consultation, please give our office a call. And then one of my colleagues in the audience with me has a few frequently asked questions, so we're going to go over those.
So the question was, does insurance cover any of these treatments? Yes, everything we talked about today is covered by insurance. None of these procedures are experimental. They're all FDA approved. And I would say a majority of insurance plans covers each and every one of what we talked about. Oh, for the sacral nerve stimulator, can patients feel some stimulation? Yes, so the stimulator has a bunch of different settings we can adjust, and when we make adjustments to the stimulator, you can feel a fluttering sensation or like a vibration in the pelvis, but that sensation is temporary, and eventually, after your adjustment is made, maybe half an hour or so later, your brain stops noticing it, and you just feel normal again. It's not painful. If we put a bladder stimulator in, can patients go to the bathroom when they want to or normally? Yes, you still get the normal sensation to go to the bathroom. There's no chance of urinary retention developing from putting a, a stimulator in. So definitely you'll still have that normal sensation and normal urgency to go to the bathroom, but without those irritating symptoms you were experiencing before. Again, I'm Carrie Stewart. I'm a urologist at Christus St. Vincent. Please let me know or call and make an appointment if you're interested in seeking care for your incontinence or urinary urgency trouble.